support and letting it happen in such a way. First of all, before joining the session as for the inaugural process, I would like to thank the Department of English of our college for arranging the Wave Lecture Series, more especially Dr. Saurabh Nag, the coordinator, Dr. Nikhilesh Dhar, and the part-time faculty members, Karthi Goin, Asim Kumar Betal, Bulti Day. Had they been, I would not have seen it materializing, taking wings. In this time of COVID-19 and its aftermath, when sets, sets of rules and regulations have undergone drastic changes, our definitions and philosophies taking a U-turn, and we're trying to cope up with survival strategies, putting emphasis on social distancing, wearing of masks in public places, health and eye hygiene in order to keep the pandemic under check and balance, how to deal and dispense with is the thing doing the rounds, but we shall try our best to deliver instead of the instead of the bad times ever seen in terms of trouble, tribulation, trauma, and crisis management, and the upheavals and repercussions taken place. Had there been not the periods of plague, malaria, cholera, viral fever, typhoid, polio, measles, chicken pox, and delivery deaths. Whatever be that, away from the mind around lockdown, red zone, yellow zone, green zone, and so on, we have tried to arrange for a lecture series, which would definitely benefit you, taking your mind to a different pedestal of thinking, warding of the evil, the virus dragon. The last of all, not the least, it is now our time to switch back to the speakers waiting in person to deliver their addresses, lectures, talks, and papers. And this, in this context, I extend my heartiest felicitations to Dr. Elham Hussain, Dhaka City College, Dhaka, Dr. Shimadri Lahiri, the University of Bardwan, Dr. Nivedita Mukherjee, Sidho Kanu Birsa, University of Purulia, Akram Muhammad Ali, El, El Kru Zahri, Al Khabd Community College, El Mahavit Yaman, Hamant Golapalli, Vidya Sagar University, Midnapur, Dr. Arnav Kumar Sinha, the University of Bardawan, Dr. Gautam Buddha Surali, Bakura University, Bakura, Dr. Sriya Bhattacharji, Central University of Jharkhand, Ranchi, Dr. Narendra Ranjan Malas, Ramanand College, Vishnupur, Dr. Nadugopal Mukherjee, Bakura Christian College, Bakura, Dr. Tuhin Majumdar, Khatra, Divasi Mahavidyalaya, Khatra, Dr. Jayati Shankar Mandal, Sridhar Kanu Birsa University, Dr. Pradipt Syam Chaudhary, the University of North Bengal. This much today's respected sirs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Like, yes, we would request Dr. Elam Hussain to deliver his lecture. Dr. Elam Hussain is a Bangladeshi academic, essayist, translator, editor, and a literary critic. He writes both in Bangla and in English. He has authored six books, namely Angst and Anxiety. Colonial ambivalence and Africa, Shaita O Nondon Bhavna, yes, Africa Literature and Aesthetics are some of his remarkable books. A good number of his research articles have been published in the journals of home and abroad. His field of interest covers South Asian and African literature and culture. At present, he is serving as associate professor and head of the Department of English of Dhaka City College, Dhaka, Bangladesh. So we would uh, like to invite Dr. Elam to deliver it, uh, to deliver his lecture. Elam uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, sir. Dr. Elam Dr. Elam Professor of English. 
from Dhaka City College, Dhaka, Bangladesh. And at first, I like to express my heart and gratitude to the Reverend Principal Sir of the Bangladesh Sir. And I like to thank all the faculty of the English Department. And I especially thank Dr. Kuro Kornan for inviting me to this webinar. I also welcome all the participants on the study of Amitya Bhutan from the perspective of Bangladesh. It's my immense pleasure to be a part of your initiative. So I express my gratitude to all. So, at the very inception of my lecture, I'd like to clarify one particular. I'd like to clarify one particular. Literature in English is immensely popular among Bangladeshi readership. A handful of Indian authors who write in English have become a significant part of our curriculums of different universities for the students of honors and master's levels. I like to mention some of the names of some Indian writers, popular Indian writers who write in English. Uh, Omitab Ghosh, Mulk Raj Anand, R.K. Narayan, Jhumpa Lahiri, Arundhati Roy, Bikram Sheth, Salman Rushdie, Arbind Adiga, and many others. These brilliant writers have become a very important part of our readership today in Bangladesh. And many writers who write in Bangla, the writers from West Bengal, are also immensely popular among us. For example, Shamaresh Mujumdar, Shirshendu Mukhabadhyay, Abul Bashar, Mohasheta Devi, Shankho Ghosh, and many others. They have become an important part of our readership. Now, I like to say at the very inception of my discussion on Amitabh Ghosh's shadow line, uh, I just like to say why Omitabh Ghosh has become relevant in our country. Omitabh Ghosh is very relevant in Bangladesh because of the wide range of his subject matters that has encompassed cultural crisis, the issues of climate change and its impact on culture. Uh, in this connection, I like to mention one of his seminal books. It's a nonfiction. The name of the book is The Great Derangement, Climate Change, and the Unthinkable. In this book, Ghosh says that climate change impacts the cultural change. That is, cultural change is closely related to climate change because it causes migration of the people. It also causes diaspora. For that reason, the study of climate change has become a very important part of Amitabh Ghosh's writing. And then another important subject matter that invites the Bangladeshi readers to have a deep reading of Amitabh Ghosh's writing. That is, he invites the readers to reread and rethink of our historiography. Just like an archaeologist, as we find in Michel Foucault's Archaeology of Knowledge, Amitabh Ghosh digs deeper into our history and historical events, like our colonial experiences post-colonial response to our history, then Bengal partition of 1905, then Indian partition of 1947, communal riot of 1963-64 uh, in Calcutta and Dhaka, the rise of capitalism, 
So all these important issues have become inevitable parts of the literary works of Amitabh Ghosh. And these issues are also very, very relevant to the Bangladeshi readers and in broad sense, the readers of the whole world. His study of the realities of the subaltern that we find in his hungry time is also an attraction, is also an important area of thinking for the Bangladeshi readers. And in Hungry Tide, uh, that is one of his seminal novels, we find that he has described the realities of the life of the subaltern living in the adjacent areas of the Sundarbans. So that very study has become a very immensely popular uh, study for the Bangladeshi leadership. Moreover, his works concentrate on the regions adjacent to the Bay of Bengal, the Arabian Sea, and the Indian Ocean. So his narratology offers multifaceted and multi-layered works that can be studied from various perspectives. It can be studied from historical perspective, cultural perspective, ecological perspective. We can analyze his texts eco-critically, and we can also approach his texts from a structuralist point of view. So I have just mentioned these perspectives to show how multifarious or multifaceted uh, writers, a writer, Amitabh Ghosh is. He really deserves our special attention. Now I like to concentrate on uh, his text, The Shadow Lines. Like his other novels, this fiction produces a narrative which is closely related to the historical realities of the people living in this subcontinent. Actually, Amitabh Ghosh is a master storyteller. And his stories make his readers acquainted with the realities that shape their identity, their nationality, their cultural identity. Actually, in an interview, Ghosh has said, a novel should reflect the reality in which it is written. The task of a novelist is not to produce propaganda. So this very assertion or this very proclamation proves that Amitabh Ghosh is a very conscious writer, a very historically conscious writer, culturally conscious writer, politically conscious writer. We cannot study Omitabh Ghosh, alienating him from the issues all around us. In this connection, if I look into the shadow lines, I find that here Ghosh has offered a historiography that challenged the colonial historiography of our subcontinent. Actually, we can uh, analyze this text or we can treat this text as a counter discourse. The discourse that our colonial rulers produced, the discourse with which they misguided us, the discourse with which they sowed the seed of hostility among us, that very discourse is anatomized by Omitabh Ghosh. And to uh, do this job, while doing this job, he has referred to, and he has also critically analyzed the historical realities related to the people of this subcontinent. 
Actually, the historiography produced by James Mill, Max Muller, and Macaulay sowed the seed of bitter communal violence. Two nation theory, Bengal partition of 1905, then Indian partition of 1947 and the successive riots in both the parts across the whimsical border. I call this border whimsical because this border was demarcated by a man, Cyril Radcliffe, who had never visited India before 1947. And he did not have the idea of the communal harmony among the people here. He did not know how the strict is constructed in our country, how Thana is formed in our uh, area. He did not have the slightest ideas of all these things. But he was appointed to demarcate the borders on the basis of the uh, religious demography. And he did this job. He completed this job only in, it is said that only in seven weeks, sitting in a room, he whimsically uh, demarcated the borders and he made millions of people refugees overnight. Millions of people became rootless overnight. And all these things, all these arbitrary activities, of the colonizers sowed the permanent seed of communal violence, which is still very often challenges our cultural identity. I think this very historical reality has been incorporated in the shadow lines of Omitav Kosh. It's a story of two families. I just like to throw uh, some light on the story of this text in brief. So we find two families here. Thamma's family or Thakurma's family living in Calcutta and her sister Maya Devi, who was the wife of Mr. Dr. Choudhury, Justice Dr. Choudhury, and at one phase of their life they went to London and there they developed intimacy with an English family, that is Price family. And Tamma's Jatha Moshai lives in Dhaka, Dhaka, the then East Bengal or East Pakistan. The story of the novel develops in a non-linear fashion through an excellent narratology emanating from a narrator who is a minor boy. His name is not mentioned in this text. He has learned to imagine a broader world from his uncle Tridi, who is killed in a riot in Dhaka in 1964. So after the killing of Tridi, the reaction that Tamma exhibits can invite the readers to explore the historical realities that have challenged the identity of Tamma. If we analyze Tamma's character from new historicist perspective or from the contextual perspective, then it is found that she was born in Dhaka in 1902. That is, she was born in Dhaka, and at that time it was East Bengal. Afterwards, she settled in Calcutta, and she was desperately trying to uh, liberate the country. That is, she even decided to join the terrorist groups to fight against the British colonizers. So she was desperate for liberty. 
but after liberty in 1947, she still, to her dismay, finds that communal violence is corrosively challenging our identity. She attempts to bring things together. So she went to Dhaka in 1964, along with 3D, that is her sister's son, then May Price, beloved of 3D, Maya Devi, Tridip's mother, to bring her Jathamoshai back to Calcutta. But in the surge of communal riot, Tridip and 90 years old Jathamoshai were killed. And another person, uh, actually Amitabh Ghosh has very tactfully chosen this character from Subaltern Group, that is Khalil Arikshapula who looks after Jetha Moshai in his old age. This rickshaw puller was also killed in the riot. So now what was the reaction of Tamma after this tragic incident? Tamma out of fury decides to sell her beloved gold chain and donate the money to fight against the Muslims. Uh, I think Tamma's character deserves intensive exploration to understand the mind of the people living in this area or in these areas. And it will also help us understand psychology then identity, the conception of nation state, culture. So these important issues invite deserve attention while we will concentrate on the analysis of the character of Tamma. And all these things that we find in this text all these things, all these issues that are presented in these texts are not accidental issues or are not, uh, these incidents did not take place overnight. Actually, as I have already mentioned that archaeology of knowledge. So if we dig deeper into the history, if we dig deeper into these realities, then we will go back to our historiography. And in this connection, I like to uh, mention Homike Bhava, Homike Bhava's famous book, Location of Culture. In that very book, Bhava has said, colonialism affects the culture and identity of the natives. And colonialism also makes the natives sway between belonging and citizenship. To lend weight to this view, let us look back to our history. Before the advent of colonial, colonialism, religious faiths or religious doctrines did not work as a political drive or did not work uh, in very extremely in political activities in India. The Hindus and Muslims worked side by side. Accommodation of differences is a typical characteristic of India. So India is great because India accommodates differences. India is proud of its greatness. Its greatness lies in its accommodative tendency or attitude. India accommodates differences. And Swami Vivekananda has declared in the World Parliament's religion in uh, Chicago that acceptance of difference was central to the Indian experience throughout its long civilizational history. So mutual cooperation, brotherhood, 
amity, affinity. These are the characteristics of Indian people. Indian people are not originally hostile to one another. The affinity between the Hindus and Muslims constructed a syncretic culture in India. Muslim poets, musicians and singers wrote or sang Hindu devotional songs. And we may uh, refer to Kaji Nuzrul Islam, who has written also Shama Shongi. And Hindus also visited, or they also thronged Sufi shrines of Muslims. So <clears throat> soldiers, suppose Muslim soldiers, under the Maratha leader, Shivaji, and many Hindu soldiers walked even uh, under the extremely Islamist ruler Aurangzeb. So there are hundreds of examples of Hindu Muslim amity, Hindu Muslim affinity in India. But large scale conflicts between Hindus and Muslims began only under colonial rule. And Shoshi Tharoor in his book, An Era of Darkness, uh, he has mentioned it also that large scale conflicts between Hindus and Muslims began only under colonial rule. Now, how and why? The answer is not hard to see. Even in 1857, the Hindu and Muslim soldiers rebelled against British Raj unitedly. The Hindus and Muslims, Hindu soldiers and Muslim soldiers revolted against British Raj unitedly. And that was a cause of headache for the British rulers. In 1857, Lord Elphinstone, the British governor of Bombay, told London that they would practice divide and rule policy in India. <clears throat> they would practice divide and rule policy in India. Actually, divide and rule policy was at first introduced by uh, King Philip, that is Alexander the Great's father. And the British borrowed that very uh, maxim and they applied here in India. A few decades later, of uh, 1857 rebellion, that was a rebellion and that was the first revolt for our independence in this subcontinent. But the British historiography has marked it, labeled it as a mutiny, that is Sepoy mutiny. Actually, branding, naming, labeling, it's a colonial politics to suppress or, or exercise hegemony upon the natives of a, a locality. So we were also the victim of that deliberate politics of British uh, colonizers. They branded that very significant episode of our history as a mere sepoy mutiny. Actually, that was the first revolt of revolt for independence. Anyway, a few decades later, Sir John Strachey said, the existence of hostile creeds among the Indian people would fortify the political position of the British Raj in India. Now, this hostility among the Creeds was also a construction of deliberate project of Warren Hastings, who was the first de facto governor general of India, Warren Hastings, in uh, 1774, he took the charge of this uh, position. He hired then 
eleven pandits and asked them to develop the ordinations of the pandits. Actually, his purpose was to divide the Hindus deliberately by using their own traditional texts and scriptures. His things was successful in introducing hierarchy uh, in Hindu society and set them against one another. So his thing very deliberately brought all these things uh, together and he put one section of people against another section of people people of one religion against people of another religion so that was a deliberate project of colonial enterprise the colonial policy kept the muslims out of the narratives of india colonial historiography divided indian history into Hindu rule, Muslim rule, and British rule. Thus deliberately put these two major groups of people against each other. That is Hindus against Muslims, Muslims against Hindus. Actually, this colonial historiography sowed the seed of two nations theory also. So two nations theory was not an accidental uh, invention of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Actually, it emanated from history. And if we, uh, just like archaeologists, explore or dig deeper into our history, then we find how this two nation theory came to Jinnah through different incidents, realities. So, two nation theory was evolutionized and it had got a long history and finally in uh, and we know that even in 1905 the Bengal was divided by Lord Carter actually he had a lame subterfuge his subterfuge was that it was done for uh, administrative purpose so that they can run the administration easily but actually their purpose was to divide the Bengalis who were very much conscious of their rights, who responded to the British colonial exploitation, who uh, at different phases of history became united and raised their voice against uh, colonial oppression. Actually, it was the British purpose it was their purpose to weaken that very voice that very stamina so they deliberately divided bengal in 1905 uh, and lord karchan did it and finally in 1947 india was divided on the basis of religious democracy which is still a fatal blow on the cultural unity, the seed of bitterness, which was sowed in 1947, germinated successively in the form of a poisonous tree of communal violence or riots. One of such corrosive riots has been depicted as a major incident in the shadow lines. The ethnic cleansing violence is started in Dhaka and Calcutta. And at that time, the sacred hair of Prophet Muhammad was stolen from Hajrat Bal Shrine of Srinagar. And on the basis of this particular incident, there was a violent riot in Dhaka and in Calcutta. And at that time, we know that Ayub Khan, who was the president of Pakistan of that time, 
instigated that very violence. He came to Dhaka, and while he was living for Islamabad in Dhaka airport, he declared that he would not to be blamed for the reaction of, uh, to that incident. That is, whatever the people of East Pakistan uh, would do, for, for, for those, he would not to be blamed. So actually, he speaks like an uh, uh, inheritor of colonial legacy. Actually, he infuriated the people. And at that time, many unwanted things happened here. Muslims grabbed the land, the houses of Hindus. They looted, plundered the business uh, or shops or business institutions or organizations of Hindus. Even the politicians who at that time held important positions in the government, also, they, they, they also got involved in this looting and plundering of the property of uh, Hindus. I, I, I like to mention a name, Abdus Sabur Khan, who was the communication minister of Pakistan at that time in 1964. He also grabbed three bigas of land of a Hindu merchant living in Kulna. His name was Rup Chand Biswas. So he grabbed three bigas of land of that very Hindu merchant. Not only that, he also built a two-story building on that land. And then Rup Chand Biswas went to the court and he won the prosecution. And the court ordered Abdul Shabur Khan to pay compensation of the amount of 1,35,000 rupees. So in such a very crucial situation or in such a very predicament, our nobles, one of the protagonists, that is Thamma, came to Dhaka to take her Jathamashai back to Calcutta. But tragically, Tridip, that is her sister's son, and Jetha Moshai of Tamma, who was a man of about 90 years, and a rickshaw puller named Khalil, who looks after Jetha Moshai, were killed in the riot. I like to say that. Omitabh Ghosh has invited his readers to reread and rethink of our his historiography. And a true investigation of our historiography will reveal the factors responsible for communal violence and our identity crisis, cultural crisis. The rereading of the colonial historiography also reveals that we find in Ranajit Guha's famous book, Dominance Without Hegemony. In that very book, Ranajit Guha has said that the British colonizers did never want to construct nation state in India. That they did in Europe. Actually, their form of uh, dominance, their form of ruling in this subcontinent was different from their government system in Europe. They did never want that India should develop as a nation state or India should uh, develop a well-organized government system. They did never want it. They did never want that the people living in this subcontinent should be made citizens. Their project was to transform the people of India into subjects, not citizens, but subjects. And they did it with a deliberate purpose of dividing the people 
on the basis of their religious ideologies, on the basis of their castes and creeds. And behind that very project, they had the only purpose of accumulating capital. We know it. And they did it very successfully. They retarded our nationalism and instigated xenophobia and disintegration among the natives, from which we are still suffering. This colonial project has put shadow lines in the form of arbitrary cartographic dem demarcations, communal or ideological differences, mutual hatred and violence. It dislocates millions of people like Tamma, who has no home. If we critically analyze Tamma's character, she seems to be an entity swaying between the sense of belonging and nationality. She was born in Dhaka, and in her old age, she comes back to Dhaka, and she gathers a very bitter experience. She, pre she falls victim to communal riot, and then she again goes back to Calcutta, and she cherishes hatred for the Muslims. So this divided self, the self which is divided between sense of belonging and nationality. Actually, all these things are the creation of colonial historiography. So these shadow lines have created socio-cultural differences across nations. A space is created between nations that discover, uh, like the narrator of this uh, novel, the narrator of this novel uh, says at one point, I like to quote him. He says, the narrator says, I believed in the reality of space. I believed that distance separates, that it is corporeal substance. I believed in the reality of nations and borders. I believed across the borders there existed another reality. The only relationship my vocabulary permitted between those separate realities was war or friendship. So I like to conclude with my emphasis on the word friendship, which in association with the openness or broadness of our minds can help us overcome shadow lines and live in close to each other with all differences. We have our differences. We have differences of our ideologies. We have differences of our geography, geographical location. But still, we are brothers. But still, we are one. We are one in our spirit. We are one. We can achieve this oneness with the broadness of our mind, with the openness of our mind, I think. This is the message that Omitabh Ghosh has put in this very text. So uh, I like to uh, stop here. Once again, I thank the organizer of this webinar and giving me an opportunity to be a part of you. I also express my gratitude to all the listeners who uh, passionately listen to me till now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, actually, I I was muted. Uh, thank you, Alamda, for such an incisive discussion of Ghosh's The Shadow Lines. Your lecture ranges from Jinha to Goha, from the two nation theory to the post nation theories, or beyond that. Our next speaker is Professor Himadri Lahiri, and I was fortunate enough to join his classes as a student at the University of Baduan. He is the former professor, Department of English and Culture Studies, University of Baduan, West Bengal. Currently, he is a professor of English at the School of Humanities, Netaji Shubhashopan University, Kolkata. He has written extensively on diaspora studies, post-colonial studies, and Indian English literature. His latest publication is Diaspora Theory and Transnationalism, which was published by Orient Black Swan in 2019. Contemporary English, Indian English Poetry and Drama, that was published by the Cambridge Scholars in 2019. And it was a co-edited book. It was co-edited by him. So I would like to request Professor Himadri Lahiri to deliver his lecture. Sir, please. And, and after, after his lecture, the floor will be open for discussion. If the audience, any of you happens to have some question or some suggestion, some discussion, anything, we shall do it after the second lecture is delivered. So I would like to request Professor Himadri Lahiri to deliver his lecture. Sir, please. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, so uh, I think I, I can be begin my lecture. Sure. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So go good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you have already come across the title of my lecture, and uh, you will find uh, two important. Uh, points there, two important focus there, foci there. Number one is Kuli diaspora, and the second one is historiography. Uh, interestingly, you know that Kuli diaspora is something uh, about which we do not know much. It is, there was a diaspora in the 19th century and early 20th century. But we are in our academia basically obsessed with the post-colonial diaspora. And therefore, what happens is that our focus is entirely on that and uh, the Kuli diaspora remains relatively unknown, uh, basically in literature departments. Uh, social science departments have already started discussing uh, Kuli diaspora, and there are quite a good number of books on Kuli diaspora. But then, uh, uh, in literature, we have taken up the issue only very recently. In India, I, I mean, uh, in in the uh, in Fiji or in Caribbean islands or in uh, the US, you will find quite a good corpus of critical works done already done. Uh, so, today's focus of my lecture is on Kuli diaspora. But then, because it is relatively unknown, what I would like to uh, point out that the historiography also comes in a big way, because uh, we have to retrieve that history. And the retrieval of the history is very important. The question is how to retrieve the history. Uh, this is a very important question that uh, social scientists and uh, literary works, literary artists uh, have been engaged in uh, doing. They are engaged in unearthing the past history because you know that uh, uh, in the archives, not many materials are available. And neither are accounts of the Kuli diaspora in, in written forms. 
the basic reason is that the coolies they were the subalterns they were mostly uneducated they were not most of them not able to uh, put their words put their experience in words and therefore what remains is a big silence and contemporary writers uh, have been trying to unearth that silence but you will find that in many of the writings and i i will refer to some of the writings later uh, you will find that uh, there are different points of view in unearthing the history the the, the blasting the silence revealing uh, whatever is uh, whatever can be retrieved so the question of uh, uh, uh historiography also becomes very important one important historiography is the feminist historiography uh that has been resorted to by uh, historians like gaitra bahadur and uh, uh, you know literary artists many many literary artists uh peggy mohan is one such artist i will come to that later on but then you see that why why do we call it kuli diaspora uh, the first thing that we should keep in mind is that in uh, 1834 uh, the act, the slavery slavery was officially abolished okay but what happened that is that uh, the capitalist ventures uh, different plantations in different colonies and uh, many other places needed uh, people to work in the fields work in the plantations and therefore what was needed that they fresh a fresh number of migrants are needed okay uh, coolies replaced the african uh, uh, the, the people who came from africa who were turned into slaves and who worked in the plantations who worked in many other places now that slavery was undone it was no more there officially speaking so you need a fresh group of people uh, who can be who can replace the slaves the african slaves and therefore a new system of slavery and the word slavery is problematical it is contested word because officially this was not a slavery it was a kind of uh, uh, agreement that was signed between the coolies and uh, the the plantation owners and the people who uh, were actually agents who sent the coolies to different plantation centers in fiji in caribbean islands in mauritius in suriname in many other places in south africa for example uh, so these people who came from uttar pradesh what we know as uttar pradesh or bihar or or uh, areas like that there were some coolies from the south as well but the main the main focus the main corpus actually came from the main number the vast numbers actually came from the north of india so these people were uh, derogatively called coolies and these people uh, were actually transported from different centers in india uh, like baranasi for example uh, to kolkata by train and then they were shipped off to different centers now you see that it also raises the question of modernity these people who didn't have any idea about modernity who were mainly scooped up in villages remote villages who didn't have any idea about modern technology uh, these people suddenly came across the new kinds of modernity the new forms of modernity for example the train so the train transported them uh, any problem uh, any problem in audio no, sir. no sir. Okay. Okay. okay so uh, they they what happened that uh, they were transported to calcutta and then from there they were shipped off 
So Calcutta became a very important center of uh, 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 the migration. And uh, interestingly, we do not know much about this transport, transportation history uh, until some people, uh, mainly those, the descendants of the endangered laborers who came forward and established many, uh, they, they, they initiated many efforts. And because of their efforts, we have come to know about this venture uh, more widely than ever before. Recently, I was fortunate enough, I was invited to speak in uh, Garden Reach, uh, in a Garden Reach seminar organized by uh, Calcutta Port Trust, who were actually uh, celebrating some kind uh, 100 years, uh, 150 years of the port. And therefore, you see, there I was fortunate enough to see the places and the uh, archive which are kept there. But this, uh, these things remain largely unknown to us, most of us. And therefore, I prefer to speak on this aspect of Kuli diaspora and uh, uh, so that we can have some discussions, some, some dialogues in future. We can write about them, we can read the texts properly, and then uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, have some discourses on them. We can uh, think uh, of these writings from different perspectives, literary perspectives and social scientist perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one thing is that uh, this Kuli diaspora it has two other nomenclatures as well. For example, it was widely known as Endangered Labor, Labor's Movement. This is the name that is widely used, but Kuli diaspora is also very well known. The Kuli is a term uh, which actually uh, uh, is a derogatory term and the Shahibs, the Englishmen, uh, they use this term derogatively to refer to this mass of men and women who were shipped off to uh, different plantation centers. Uh, so indentured diaspora is one uh, uh, term which is widely used, but there is also another term and we, this term is the Girmitia, Girmitia diaspora. Interestingly, you know that Girmitia is a term which comes from the word agreement. Okay, these uh, coolies and uh, the people who are illiterate, who didn't know much about uh, their journeys, the destinations and uh, uh, reasons, these people were made to sign an agreement and uh, these people couldn't properly pronounce the word cool, uh, agreement and therefore, uh, Girmitia is a corrupt, Girmit is a corrupt form of agreement. And it has come to this same diaspora is also known as Girmit diaspora. And the people who uh, went there, they are known as Girmitias. Interestingly, Girmitias has been, the word has been taken, even the Kuli word has been taken in a very positive manner by the coolies, by the erstwhile endangered laborers. Uh, because you know, it celebrates the kind of pioneering roles they played in the, in, during the uh, colonial period and the kind of uh, 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 resilience, uh, valor they needed. It celebrates, these words actually celebrates that kind, that kind of attitude. And the descendants of the Kuli diaspora, they also uh, come in a big way to celebrate the events. And uh, they have been, since uh, the uh, uh, Kuli diaspora started more or less in 1837, you see these people have been trying to uh, project the various, direct, uh, various dimensions of Kuli diaspora through different media and through different institutions. Now you see that uh, uh, the colonial, uh, the one important question may be, why is it that the uh, people, the schoolies left their places and uh, uh, left for unknown regions? Because they had to 
cross the Kalapani, the black waters, which was an area uh, uh, not to be transcended, that was according to the Hindu philosophy, according to the Hindu religion. So uh, why is it that the forbidden zone of the sea, the black water, the Kalapani, uh, these people pre prefer to actually ship, uh, to be shipped off across the Kalapanis. That's the big question. So it naturally uh, uh, keeps our focus on the Indian situation during the, 19, uh, during the 19th century and the 20th century. So this people, uh, India was a country which suffered uh, very much from uh, poverty. And because of poverty, families migrated from one place to another within India itself. Uh, there are many families where, uh, in which uh, the husband figure, they migrated to other, uh, other places and the wives remained in families, wives and other members of their families. So poverty is one reason. Uh, second reason is the, the Shoti Daho Protha, the Sati. Uh, many, many women, they wanted to escape Sati and they, they uh, preferred to go to Calcutta and then join the Kuli diaspora. And uh, so you see, even after the abolition of Shoti Daho Protha or the Shoti rights, what happened that the situation was such in many families in the rural uh, India that the widows and the uh, women who did, couldn't produce uh, male children, they were forced to leave their families because of the tortures inflicted on them by their families. Uh, so, so for various reasons, you know, the patriarchal oppressions and uh, uh, many colonial oppressive measures, many people actually left uh, the, this, uh, uh, their places, their, uh, their villages, their homes, and uh, preferred to uh, go to different pl uh, plantation centers. They became coolies. Uh, I will like to uh, uh, remind you of Amitabh Ghosh's uh, Sea of Poppies. The, uh, the earlier lecture was on Amitabh Ghosh, and you can connect this, how Amitabh Ghosh can shift from one subject to another. Uh, sea of Poppies is one example of the Kuli diaspora. You will find reflections of Kuli diaspora in a very elaborate, in a very elaborate, in a very elaborate manner. Uh, he has done lots of researches. Uh, almost all his books are based on researches, and he has done lots of uh, researches in this area and wrote Sea of Poppies. You will find uh, characters like Diti and uh, Kalua, for example. Those of you who have already gone through the text, you will identify these two names. Diti fled Sati. Okay, Diti's husband died and he was, he was saved by Kalua, who belonged to a Lua caste family. And therefore, both of them fled the society and joined uh, the Kuli diaspora. There is also, there are many other kinds of figures. For example, you will find uh, Jaminder Neil Rathon Halla. He was forced to leave uh, the Kuli, uh, forced to leave. His, his uh, property was uh, taken, taken off uh, through a judicial means, and he was forced to join this Kuli diaspora. So you can easily find out that it is because of the many, many uh, uh, reasons like widowhood, like patriarchal tortures, like uh, colonial repressive measures, like uh, poverty, like drought. Uh, the people, many people, uh, they, uh, they left their places willingly for the Kuli diaspora. But there were also many people, especially women, who were trapped by agents and sub-agents of the transporting authorities who are known as Arkatis. So you see that these huge mass of people uh, ultimately assembled at Garden Reach Depot. And as soon as they assembled in uh, uh, that depot, they 
lost their uh, 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 older, they had to forsake their older identity and they had to assume new identities. They knew that their older identities must be uh, actually forsaken now and a new journey must be undertaken. Now, uh, I would like to read two quotations from uh, Bridge Vilal, who had a wonderful book, The Other Side of Midnight. So from this book, I will read two quotations. Uh, number one quotation is, children of the Gilmit diaspora have uh, rescued the indentured experience from the remote and reviled fringes of modern historiography and given the Gilmitias once regarded as the steep children of lesser gods, voice, agency, and humanity. So many of these coolies had actually taken new names. And many of the coolies, many of them were Brahmins, for example. And they, uh, uh, for, they actually forsook their uh, sacred threads in the water of the Ganges and took new names. And you see that this was an experience, transformative experiences, which, uh, which, which is something which we should study because as soon as they boarded the jahaj, the ship, they became jahaji bhais and jahaji bahins. Uh, if you read uh, Amitabha Ghosh's Sri of Poppies, you will find that in the ship, in the, in the, in the bajra, actually one kind of shuna, which there the women are talking about the fact that they have already become jahaji bahins. So they were already forming a kind of a platform from where they can form families and uh, communities, new communities in the new lands. So from that point of view, it was a novel experience. Uh, why, why do I uh, choose this area for today's lecture? Uh, I will read another uh, uh, quotation from Bridge Vilal. There was no written history about them, just, uh, just some hearsay, memories, a collage of conflicting testimonies about a past that seemed remote and irrelevant. I wanted to revisit the vanishing past. So for the uh, descendants, uh, what happened is that this journey, which has been called Odyssey by Gayutra Bahadur in his book, in her book, uh, Kuli Omen, you see, this became a very important point of focus for historians and literary historians, literary artists. So since there was almost no uh, stories available either in the archives or any written document, uh, archives were very poorly maintained and therefore uh, the stories had really had to be retrieved through different means. Archive was obviously one such uh, means, but then uh, there were other means also, very important means, I'm coming to that. But uh, you see that whatever I, I, I cannot, during this small, uh, the, during this period, limited period, I cannot go to any text in particular. I have just referred to Amitabh Ghosh, who was not a descendant of uh, diasporic, uh, this Kuli diaspora. But there are quite a good number of uh, uh, writings now uh, who, who actually uh, resorted to new historiography. The new historiography that I am talking of, who are these uh, writers you know of V.S. Naipal, who actually wrote mostly in the older fashion, and he did not actually uh, 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 resort to the new, techno new historiographical methods. But there are, for example, Ramabai Espinet, one important writer uh, who has written The Swinging Bridge, published in 2003. Uh, Gayatra Bahadur, I have already mentioned, uh, her Kuli Oman is equally very well known and is being discussed right now 
in different uh, on different forums, which was published in 2013. Bridgeville Isles, the other side of midnight, uh, which was published in 2003. Uh, Peggy Mohan's Jahajins, which was uh, published uh, by Harper Collins. The year I have forgotten. It was probably sometime around 2013 or 14. I'm not very sure. But interestingly, very interestingly, in 2018, an anthology has been published, and this anthology is known as We Mark Your Memory, uh, which is a collection of uh, different kind of oral stories, reminiscences, uh, uh, pieces, uh, poems, etc., etc., which was edited by David Davidin. Uh, it was published in 2018 by School of Advanced Study, Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, you can easily see the involvement of the uh, academia in this search, and this can also be found in Peggy Mohan's Jahajins, the character who is unearthing the past, trying to unearth the past, is a linguist uh, who is a research scholar, and he's trying to find out the kind of Bhojpuri language that persists in the diaspora, and uh, what kind of differences they have uh, with the Bhojpuri of India, spoken in India. So this is this kind of a new historiography uh, is very interesting in the sense that all these books actually go uh, forward and backward in time. They, they start in the present time, but, that, but then they go backward and then come forward again to the present time. And therefore, there is a two and fourth journey in these kinds of narratives. Why is it so? Because there is absolutely no material, very few materials available in the archives. And the first generation, the coolies, the original coolies, they are passing away. They are vanishing from the faces of the art. And therefore, the artists, the, sci the social scientists, the uh, literary uh, writers, they are all focusing on, they are taking interviews, they are, they, they are going to these people and they are actually collecting materials, interviews, and other kinds of hearsays, stories that are in circulation, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a matter of methodology as well and uh, this, uh, these methodologies uh, actually are very important in the sense that, uh, for example, one prominent source is the archive. archive. So archive, archival methodology is pursued here. But then uh, you cannot depend on archives. Gayatra Bahadur couldn't depend on uh, archive. Peggy Mohan couldn't depend on archive. Uh, uh, or other writers like Espinet, Ramabai Espinet, couldn't uh, depend on archives because archives couldn't uh, properly give them materials. So what did they do? Uh, they took help of what uh, Bridge Filal calls faction. Facts, faction is a portmanteau word which is uh, a, 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 uh, which is combined with the two words, fiction and faction, faction and fiction. So you combine both fact and fiction. So fiction, why fiction? Especially uh, you will find that uh, uh, this, 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 uh, th this kinds of narratives, Peggy Mohan's narratives or uh, uh, Gaitra uh, Bahadur's narratives, Kuli Oman, they, there are materials which were found, but there are vast areas of silence. So this silence can only be approached if you have uh, imagination. So through imagination, through interviews, through your transactions with interactions with the members of the uh, diaspora families, you have to collect information. 
And there are even then when you collect information, there remains gaps. And how can you fill up the gaps? You can only fill up the gaps with the help of uh, uh, imagination. So imagination plays a very important role here and it is not actually seen in an unfav unfavorable manner. Uh, oral methodology therefore comes handy here in this kind of writing. And as a historian, uh, 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 Gaitra Bahadur uh, takes help of this uh, kind of uh, uh, methodology. And uh, therefore, and as a historian, you see, Bridge Bilal takes help of this methodology. Uh, they, they go to the songs, for example, songs called Bideshia which are even now sung in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh and many other areas. Videshias are songs which lament the loss of the family member who have gone to different places and cannot be found again. They have not returned. So with the help of these materials available, the uh, uh, writers, fiction writers, they build up narratives, they build up the history of Puli uh, narratives. So from that point of view, they do not only remain static in their immigrant society, immigration society or immigrant society, but they also visit India from where they, the, which is the point of genesis for them. So uh, going to uh, uh, India, Uh, is considered to be a pilgrimage. Bridge Bilal calls it a pilgrimage. Uh, Gayatra Bahadur calls it a pilgrimage. It is a pilgrimage in order to establish your own identity. The writers want to confirm their own identity. Unless and until they know who they are, where they come from, they, they cannot establish their, they cannot remain satisfied. So they visited their old places, India, not that they were very happy because the old village, uh, they, uh, when they heard about uh, Gayatra Bahadur's uh, grand, great grandmother's migration, uh, they, they were very skeptical. They were angry. Why is it that a girl in the 19th century, they left the place? the village, because she violated the norms of patriarchy. So why is it that she should leave? So Gayatra Bahadur's experience was not very pleasant when she visited the village twice, okay? And uh, the same experience was also faced by uh, the, uh, the Bridge Villa. So you see that despite these kinds of uh, 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 actually experiences, these visits are considered very important because until, unless and until you go to India, your journey is not complete. So faction is very important historiography in this respect. And faction, since faction is something which makes you go to India in order to fill up the gaps, the visiting, revisiting India also becomes a very sacred duty. So from that point of view, uh, these writings are wonderful writings and this corpus, we need to go to this corpus. Otherwise, this quasi-fictional means of expression would not have been possible unless and until you go through such methodologies. I think my uh, time is uh, probably over and I should stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, you strike the keynote of the way lecture series uh, with your groundbreaking discussion of Kuli diaspora. And uh, I was uh, getting a, getting quite nostalgic because uh, constantly the memories of attending your classes, Samostri is also present here. So uh, I hope that she is feeling the same. So actually, uh, we are now on in the last phase of our web lecture. 
and it is the the floor is now open to all i request the audience if you have any suggestion if you have any question any doubts to clear so now the floor is open so you can unmute yourself ask the question or give the suggestion and then mute yourself and i request everyone to turn your cameras on so that we may take some screenshot for newspaper reports so you may uh, ask question or or any uh, suggestion uh, let me inform you one thing uh, dr elha mohsen has to leave uh, he has sent me a mail that he has some urgent engagement and that's why he couldn't stay with us for the second session so the floor is open only for the second session now since the presenter is not uh, with us we cannot uh, ask any question so if you have any question any queries or any suggestion so you may please proceed hello sir good afternoon everyone uh, sir i am shankar subra choudhury from mandathana mahavidyalaya sixth semester sir um, can you please light us on the uh, uh, change of uh, coolie dash for uh, from the uh, indenture shift to the uh, to the uh, from the indenture indenture shift to the <laughs> post colonial or to the transnational communities the change of coolie diaspora from indenture ship to the trans uh, national communities and the uh, um, unbearable uh, dialects between the uh, exploitations and liberations of uh, of the sufferers uh, i do not exactly get the question do you do you, uh, are you asking uh, uh, the differences between the old diaspora the coolie diaspora and how it uh, shifted on to the new diaspora which is the uh, transnational uh, i mean transnational transnational post, post colonial diaspora this kind of question i don't yes. exactly get your the shift you say are the differences the shift from the indenture ship uh, to the transnational community acha uh if i uh, i'm not sure whether i have understood the question properly you see but then let me uh, try to guess and answer uh, but uh, the question actually raises uh, two basic uh, issues actually number one the kuli diaspora who were, who were originally rooted in the homeland and then the transnational diaspora they became transnational communities although the transnational community the term has come up very recently it was not usually used at that time so so you see that uh, interestingly this diaspora the basic diaspora uh, the basic point is that this diaspora belongs to the subaltern this is a subaltern diaspora this is a diaspora of mainly the low caste people there were brahmins as well but then the brahmins had to give up their identity okay the caste identity and this diaspora was transformative okay the jahaj itself the ship itself was the site of transformation you know that untouchability was very much persistent in indian society in 19th century and early 20th century but when all people come together and they do not they they touch each other they become jahaji bhais and jahaji bonds bahins okay and they form a kind of a uh, friendship and uh, uh, they 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 build up a platform from where the family formation and the community formation started okay and after landing in the uh, uh, plantation economies what happened there also despite their dip dip depressions despite the tortures despite everything after the end of the first term of indenture which was 5 years they many of them came back to that indenture again but then they uh, many of them also preferred not to join the indenture and settled in the uh, in mauritius caribbean islands etc etc okay so gradually a new form of transnational 
community began to grow there. But please mind that this community was transformed in the sense that they did not uh, obey, they didn't pay loyalty to the old patriarchal rules, initially, initially at least, and all kinds of people, irrespective of, the, of their class and caste, came together and became one family, Jahaji Bhais and Jahaji Bahins. But in contrast to that, the post-colonial diaspora, the transnational diaspora, is interestingly quite different. They, these people do, are not, they do not belong to the lower caste people or lower caste class people. They are middle class people and many of them belong to the higher classes as well, and upper middle class and aristocratic classes. These people are uh, jocularly often called uh, cyber coolies, okay? They are called cyber coolies, keeping in mind their professions. So you see the basic difference is very, very clear. This diaspora was the diaspora of the common people, poor people, were forced to leave their lands. So there was a coercion there, but the new diaspora, the post-colonial transnational diaspora is basically a diaspora of middle-class people and uh, uh, upper middle-class people. So this is the basic diaspora. These are called coolies and these are called, the new diaspora people are called, uh, you see, uh, cyber Police. So this is basically the main difference between the two diasporas. I hope yes, I have yes. answered you. Any other question? Anyone sir, like this is Arno. <laughs> uh, please, uh, please. So I, I don't think I need. <laughs> hi, uh, sir. Uh, uh, so I don't think I need to introduce myself. Uh, 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 anyway. Uh, so, as you have rightly pointed out that uh, uh, regarding archives, uh, we, we are not sure whether uh, these archives provide any kind of information. And uh, when we go through uh, Peggy Mohan's Jahaji, we find that uh, you know, she is uh, quite skeptical um, about uh, the nature of these archives. And uh, you know, she even says that even, you know, it's a character who uh, finds that uh, the archive that has been created. It's all about the, the linguistics or the language spoken by the men. The, you know, the female voice is totally absent or the female language is totally absent from the from these archives. So that is true, you know, meaning uh, the politics of archiving does play a very, very significant role. But as you said that uh, factions uh, are dependable and, uh, you know, factions, I have I've gone through Bridge Bilal's uh, The Other Side of Mid Midnight. And, uh, you know, factions, as uh, we all know, uh, they are partly fictional and partly, you know, based on facts. So then my question is, sir, can we also, in a sense, entirely uh, depend on these factions? Because we don't know how much uh, of fiction and how much of facts, uh, you, know, you know, have been mixed in that way to, to create, you know, these kinds of, you know, texts. So are they, you know, completely dependable? Uh, that is that is that is the point which I want to you know in a sense ask you or I want to know your response. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, you are muted. Hello, uh, Himadri, sir. You are muted, sir. Please unmute yourself. Hello, sir. Sir, mute Sir, is it okay? Yes, now it's okay. Now it's okay. So, uh, uh, your question is very uh, intelligent question, but I would uh, ask you to consider these questions from two points of view, because two disciplinary points of view. Number one, the social scientist's point of view, and number two, literary artist's point of view. Now, you see that in uh, social sciences like history, for example. And the two books I have mentioned, the two authors I have mentioned are historians. For them, it was very, very difficult to uh, actually build up the narrative. History is also a narrative. So build up the building up the narrative is very important. So uh, uh, in a history, for example, the main question that uh, uh, goes around is the question of authenticity. 
Okay. Mm. So how much authenticity can you guarantee through this method? That comes, your question comes to that from the historical point, from the point of view of the historians. Okay. But then you see, I can't really answer this question because there is uh, what people today say, the critics today say, that uh, the nature of authenticity itself is problematical. So, so you see the way the uh, actually archive builds up narratives, the history books which are written on the basis of narratives, the narratives which are actually provided by uh, uh, written documents, archival documents, and uh, all other documents which are usually taken as authentic, this uh, these historians basically depend on that, but in the process, they also live out the lives as they were lived at one point of time. So in order to guess what kind of lives they actually lived, you have to have access to imagination. So from that point of view, the historian's point of view of authenticity was limited. Okay, so that is why uh, the new historians, many of them are taking help of literature. They are taking help of the oral narratives and oral narratives have come up. For example, in the building up of the partition narratives these days, uh, mm. material memory has come into, uh, come to play a big role. Uh, material yeah. memory in the sense of, uh, it means, as you know, uh, for example, I have an organ ornament, old ornament. So mm. the descendant is taken back to the grandfather or the grandmother or anybody else. So any kind of material object can take you back to that time. And that gives you some kind of idea about what the time was like. Okay. So this yeah. kind of materials we need to access as well. So history was incomplete. History is incomplete with the, without this kind of uh, access and uh, therefore uh, uh, from the point of view of historian of course both kinds of uh, 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 perspective should be taken into account and uh, from the point of view of the literary artists like fiction writers it is easier okay they have to imagine a story they have to build up a narrative but then this narrative is based on something which which is there and which is not there, okay? Which is there because you know you, you are part of that society, you are part of that community. So it is there, but it is not there simply because you do not, you do not know what happened in the seas, what happened in the other part of the seas, okay? What happened in India, for example? Why is it your grandfather or grandmother or great-grandfather or great-grandmother kind of experiences uh, did uh, you you come across? So, are you what you are? Are you a Brahmin now? Right now, you are not a Brahmin. For example, you are Khatriya. So, are you really a Khatriya, or in the beginning was you a, a were you really a Brahmin? So, your identity is not established from that point of view. So, literary artists also uh, were a kind of historians. Okay, they were historians in the sense that they took help of the oral narratives that is in currency in the community and in the family. And they took help of the family heirloom. Okay, what kind of memory they can find there. So from that, they built up the narratives. So from that point of view, it is wonderful. And uh, it, it also uh, establishes a kind of authenticity. Okay, not authenticity in the sense of the historians, Historical. the mainstream mm. historian, but authenticity nevertheless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Sometimes fully does. Any other question or any suggestion from anyone? There is, a, I think there is a question, something like transnational diaspora is also fully diaspora. It is certainly a fully diaspora. Uh, because if you take the word transnational in the original, in the etymological sense of the term, it, it is a diaspora that transcends the place, the nation, the country. So from that point of view, it is a transnational diaspora. 
but transnationalism is being used today in a different sense especially by the social scientists okay so from that point of view it was not exactly a transnational diaspora but then then we cannot say in precise terms that it it was not transnational diaspora because the uh, uh, the play of the capital was very much evident there it was also a capitalist venture so so from that point of view there was organized these were the activities organized by the organized uh, capitalists so it was certainly a capital is a, is a transnational diaspora but in a bit different sense any other question this was basically about uh, the lives of the coolies if you think of the coolie diaspora it was it started at about 1837 and ended at about 1937 uh, or something like that i am not very precise in the in mentioning the death but during the period uh, it was mainly the coolies who went to the plantations okay plantation side so it is overwhelmingly a coolie diaspora there were some people uh, businessmen for example or some other people uh, who went there in order to see uh, to the systems the infrastructure etc technicians they went there so there were some people but they were part of the colonial venture they 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 worked on the part of the colonies colonial masters and some were independent businessmen so it was overwhelmingly a coolie diaspora no doubt about that any other question if time permits no sir there is enough time uh, is there any other question yes uh, as someone put question uh, wage wage laborers are also moving usually to uh, the arab countries and uh, at one point of time kuli diaspora also sent a good number of kulis to the southeast asian countries okay so uh, you are right in saying that uh, there is a different kind of diaspora which is not which has not come into focus these days for example the a uh, wage earners who are sent to the arab countries for example for a short period of time or a longer period of time they are not much discussed yes in a sense they are also kuli if you use if you uh, actually use the word kuli in a much more uh, reflective much more wider sense much wider sense you are right they are kulis no doubt about that okay but we are basically concerned about the post colonial uh, middle class diaspora who live in india on their own on their own volition okay uh, they were not coerced okay and these people were uh, some people uh, say that for you king uh, many uh, many historians uh, uh, they 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 call that this was kuli diaspora of the 19th century or early 20th century but a new form of a new form of slave diaspora okay it was officially not a slave diaspora but it was also called slave diaspora because the conditions as you find it there actually was remin reminiscent of the kuli diaspora after landing in the new plantation centers the coolies were for example kept in the houses and the depots which were originally meant for the slaves the african slaves so many people also compare this with middle passage african uh, uh, african uh, uh, laborers middle passage they are also called so there are uh, there are controversies about that but it was not officially a, a slave diaspora so i think there is a uh, question posted in the chat in the chat box what is the question the relevance of retrieving the uh, the lost languages of the laborers by the third and fourth generation descendants is it a tool of identity negotiation or some linguistic value lies there too 
and the question was posted by yasmin from west bengal uh, so it's of course uh, it's part of that okay uh, of course uh, you see you cannot see it just in terms of linguistics okay it, you cannot just see it in terms of exercise of your uh, energy that you invest in your research a phd or a phd research uh, that is there but then you see it was more than that because it it concerned your own identity also as i have told you earlier that most of this retrieval narratives actually was, were concerned with the identity of the self who am i what kind of identity do i have am i really what what kind of caste do i have am i a brahmin am i a kshatriya am i a chamar what kind of identity do i have or did i have originally so these are the things which needed to be investigated and uh, in so far as language is concerned bhojpuri language uh, is concerned for example bhojpuri is spoken of there mainly so it is also an exercise in finding uh, what kind of language was there and what kind of people they were so and how it has been transformed in the course of the journey and the, in the course of settlement in a different place of uh, a di different place in a different diasporic space so so it is not only about language and culture but it is also about who you are about your identity your family identity your community identity and uh, no uh, there is a question about the brahmins where they whether they were forced to leave uh, uh, where they were coerced to leave uh, no not everyone okay uh, uh, there some may have been trapped for example many uh, women who are brahmin they were trapped by the argatis but there are many men who are not forced to leave they left because of poverty for example okay or because of any other reasons like jealousy uh, like loss of property okay so material reasons so all these people uh, came to calcutta uh, somewhere or other and left for the plantation centers plantation economies uh, because they wanted money and they had more or less they had the dream that they would come back one day to india again but there was it was it was quite problematic uh, because the kalapani crossing was there if they come back the people may not accept him so not all the brahmin were forced to leave uh, uh, so so you see that uh, that was one point okay the many were for but women many women were free forced to flee because they fled the uh, the uh, sati for example they they for they were no longer they were destitutes because they were no longer required in the family because they were childless or they didn't produce the male children or it was a patriarchal society highly patriarchal feudal society or uh, uh, they had huge properties uh, which the uh, relatives wanted to grab so there were different kinds of reasons for which they were forced to forced to live they were forced to live but there were many people also who were not forced to live okay so so uh, i think i can i have given you the answer uh, any other question so i think all the questions have been answered okay okay so uh, it is time to be valediction to you uh, let me tell you that uh, tomorrow we are going to have professor nivedita mukherji from shidukanu birsha university purulia and akram mohammad ali alquazi from yemen and we shall meet virtually tomorrow at 12 sharp so uh, i think let us call it a day thank you everyone thank you uh, himadri sir for giving time to us and enlightening us
thank you sir thank you very much we are indebted to you thank you thank you everyone thank you the audience okay goodbye goodbye bye bye thank you bye sir thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir bye nice meeting you all thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you bye Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.